presentation. Welcome back to another Untitled Tiff review. I am one of your hosts, Matt Rohrbeck, alongside he's allergic to tomatoes, but he is tomato meter approved, Eric Marchin. Matt, we're both humans. We are. We are. Thank you, Eric. Today no we are reviewing. <laughs> that was <laughs> fair. Fair. <laughs> um, today I'd like are... to state the obvious. <laughs> today we are reviewing uh, Stephen Karam's The Humans, uh, an adaptation of his own uh, Tony Award winning uh, play, uh, which has just premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival, a film adaptation uh, starring uh, Beanie Feldstein, uh, Richard Jenkins, Amy Schumer, Stephen Yun, uh, Jane Howdy Shell. Uh, great name. Great name. Eric, uh, how are you? We took a little Howdy bit of shell a... shell the blowfish? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we took a little bit of a break, uh, you know, in the middle of the festival. Um, I hope you're But we've still been watching stuff. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I slowed down a lot. I feel like this year... Um, well, after that Dune review. Yeah, I know. We had to, you know, go into hiding. <laughs> we had to <laughs> jo- join the Freeman in hiding. Um, Are they going to say uh, John Cryer in Hiding Out? Sure, sure. Where he plays a, a sort of a Wall Street uh, white collar yuppie who ends up going back to high school and <laughs> pretends he's a high school student, which is almost the same plot as Dear Evan Hansen. Fair, fair. Uh, <laughs> you can tell we're getting a little loopy at the end of the festival, but that's what's kind of fun because like, I feel like this year especially, all the P&I screenings ended on, what, Tuesday, I believe? Um, yeah. And so, which is usually they go until the Friday, uh, like near the end of the festival. So we've still been watching stuff on the digital platform and kind of catching up with things, um, you know, but I did really slow down after, you know, that first weekend. Um, but then you get something like this, and I know we have varying opinions and, and degrees of how much we liked it, but um, something like this was just such a wonderful, like pleasant unexpected surprise for me i guess in the latter half of the festival and that's one reason why i always love tiff is that you know i i knew of this movie i knew oh steven young richard jenkins beanie feldstein a24 movie i didn't know much about it other than that i hadn't heard of the play or 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 anything uh threw it on in bed which is another weird place to watch a tiff movie just lying in bed uh with nevis my fiance and uh, i was absolutely blown away i really loved this movie and i can't wait to talk about it yeah, I I had an interesting experience watching this. Oh, movie right, you can get into that too. <laughs> I I watched this at like three a.m. and this you've was had a night. weird sleep schedule the latter half of the festival. Yeah, I don't even know half the time if I'm actually sleeping or if I'm just kind of like paused. Um, so I'm watching this movie at like three a.m. Uh, there was a huge thunderstorm. Huge, yeah. And, and to the point where there were power outages. And so I'm watching this movie and there's a scene where Richard Jenkins's character, Eric Blake, um, goes to grab a uh, lantern that they've brought for uh, Beanie Feldstein's Bridget. And their pow- uh, well, their power's not going out, but the bulbs are bursting. And yeah, it's, it's 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 an older building. The circuitry uh, isn't working as well. And there's kind of a creepy kind of quality to sort of the, the maintenance of, of this film specifically. So anyways, the power goes out and Jenkins is holding this, this lantern. And that's when the power went out uh, in, in the house, uh, in my house. And I was thinking to myself, 4DX baby. (laughs) I know this, this this is like some sort of weird, like for, as you mentioned, 4DX experience, uh, you know, just enhanced by it all. And um, also the other thing is it wasn't like I could just tether my, um, uh, you know. Oh, they don't let you watch unless you're on Wi-Fi, right? Right. So you know what the saving grace was? I woke up at 6 a.m. and and the Wi-Fi was still not working, but the Wi-Fi was working at Tim Hortons. <laughs> Which is just literally could you down. get it from your house or did you go to Tim Hortons to watch? No, it? no, no. It was oh. I was working from my house. I'm like that's so, incredible if you went and sat in a Tim Hortons to oh, watch no, the rest I, no. of this movie. I mean, they I would, they, they I weren't even open. No, they're not open to uh, uh, right. the public. It's just literally drive through. Oh right. Um. So thanks to Tim Hortons' <laughs> Wi-Fi, not I was sponsor, able to see the rest of the film. But I did like that weird kind of meta experience. Oh, it yeah. kind of reminded me of of seeing. Um, Jean-Luc Godard's goodbye to language at the light box and about halfway through the film someone just punched you right in the face <laughs> no 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 it, it literally stopped right and the power went out and everybody at first thought it was a part of the movie so we're just sitting there waiting mm-hmm. and then like 10 minutes later 
you know, someone who works there comes in and is like, oh, we're, we're, you know, the projector crashed and we're getting it back up. Uh, just, this isn't a part of the film <laughs> and everybody just started laughing. Yeah. So I think, you know, that that's the TIFF experience of this year for me is, is watching the humans at 3 AM, you know, and then the power goes out at, at a key scene where the characters also experience a power outage. But essentially what you have here, as you mentioned, is a stage to screen adaptation that takes place on Thanksgiving <laughs> and sort of the, interpersonal dynamics of this family all of which are going through their own sort of personal anxiety and stresses we see richard jenkins uh prominently throughout this film kind of looking at the infrastructure of this old building that's in chinatown in new york and seeing sort of almost like almost this again i hate using this word as a descriptor because it just kind of feels you know, very commonplace and we use it a lot during T10, but it almost has a Cronenbergian-esque kind of yeah. quality to it. Or even Roman Polanski's The Tenant, where uh, Roman Polanski at one point digs into the wall of his apartment building and finds sort of a bag of teeth. Yeah, uh, it's like alien there. almost, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it, it does have an H.R. Giger kind of sort of um, organic quality. Like it feels yeah. like it's going to start breathing or something. Yes, yeah. Um, but it also is very much it's not a horror movie, but it is horror adjacent where there are some fun little jump scares. And, you know what and... it reminded me of last year was um, uh, Shiva Baby. And yeah, it, it like does that. have that anxiety and the stress, the horrors of being not only human, but the horrors but of spending time with family <laughs> yeah, and too. sort of seeing, you know, sides of your family that you wouldn't otherwise and realize maybe, you know, you're not so far off or that you know maybe you're in better standing than you thought you were compared to somebody else mm -hmm. who you think has you know it more together as as the story progresses we find out that you know certain characters are going through um varying degrees of you know uh stress whether it be financially whether it be medically um you know it, it kind of all sort of accumulates to this one sort of big moment uh, during Thanksgiving before the said power goes out. But um, what I like the most about it is the performances and mm -hmm. just, I look at someone like Richard Jenkins and I think that he reminded me one of your dad a little bit, uh, especially Dude, with the I drinking get, of the Coke. I, I will get into this movie <laughs> and how much Eric it blew my mind of how much I saw my family and myself in this movie. It is literally the Rorbex, the movie, other than, you know, certain things Well, that Nevis happened. would be Steven Yeun um, in this case. <laughs> yeah, but even then, if you switch Steven Yeun and, and Beanie Feldstein, and I, I – because even Steven Yeun's character has a lot of similarities to what I You're am You're always making in lists. My, in my early 30s and, and, and stuff like that, and, and, you know, Beanie Feldstein being in the arts world and Nevis is in the arts world. And, and Richard Jenkins just literally reminding me of my dad and then Jane Howdy Shell literally reminding me of my mom throughout the entire thing and then having Amy Schumer be like kind of what my sister too and it, Eric it blew my fucking mind watching this going how how much I saw myself and my family in this movie and I'll get into that's a reason I think I have such a strong connection to it and that why I really loved it yeah I, I thought of that as I mean well, I'm sure there were a lot of families with, but with the coke thing though specifically where, where like Jenkins asked for the him coke walking well. around and just the way his mannerisms were and the way he was speaking was just like very much my dad and just being like reserved but also will chime in and give his opinion on things and like uh, and stuff like that and yeah the the bottle of coke and i mean my dad doesn't doesn't really drink so maybe the the beer that he's consuming right. in the movie too but like yeah and, and your dad's perfect, also a, but... a much nicer guy than than eric even though eric's but not a bad then, person but, but i think every family can you know you've only seen my dad in certain situations right, right. like I, I saw very much my everybody has and... their their good and bad yeah, side or, and or, i think or when their... you're and yeah. when you're just with family, that stuff will come out, right? And just how, like, comfortable they were with one another, but, like, and just how casual this whole thing was is very much the vibe of my family. Um, you know, Deidre, um, uh, who's the mother, um, I said reminded me of my mom. She literally, Eric, when she starts talking about Weight Watchers and how she's not counting points that day, I – Nevis and I were like crying and laughter because I know it again a lot of these can be attributed to a lot of you know 
middle class, you know, white families and and things like that. But, it's very universal, um, right? Yeah, like, even though it's just, also still specific. But there were still some things that were so specific because, like, we'll poke fun at my mom who constantly talks about her Weight Watchers that she's on and her counting points. And even my sister and I were on, we're trying to do Weight Watchers, and it's all we would talk about for a little while. And just like, I don't know, man. It's just I'll let you keep going too. But like, um, that was no, one go, element. Yeah that I just really loved about this movie and I'll just kind of go into it. And, you know, we talk about how, you know, stage plays and adaptations of them can sometimes be, um, you know, a little pointless or just, they don't add anything cinematic. And I think this movie does uh, a really good job, especially with, uh, lol Crowley's, um, I said lol. (laughs) Uh, I just thought that's, I did it all for the lols. Uh, Yeah. I, I thought that was a great name, but, uh, Crowley's, uh, cinematography in the movie. And like you said that, like, um, just the overall like unsettling nature of the whole movie that just personified you know the anxieties in this man and kind of uh you know with you said seeing the kind of cracks and the decrepitness of this old apartment and then there'll be like really well placed jump scares that aren't really jump scares but if you're someone dealing with inner anxieties and stuff like that like anything can kind of set you off and i just thought the film did a really good job of and i'm sure the stage play has a great sound design as well and but i think they were able to do with the cinematography and getting close into those performances and the way that it kind of flowed through the house or showed you close-ups of the wall and and things that were happening in this house and made it a character too was something that you know added you know something you wouldn't get from that stage play because it is very much you know it's a one-act play it all takes place in this apartment i could envision in my head exactly how it would be portrayed on stage right with just the one thing and it's i'm sure they do it in almost one take um but I just really kind of loved it for it kind of analyzing the anxieties of life. And I just thought it was like quietly devastating and very raw and with fantastic performances that felt, you know, lived in and felt very, like you said, universal, but then also very specific to just my family, which I think maybe makes me enjoy this movie probably even more than maybe some others would. And then that's why I think it's one of my favorite movies of the year. But like, I just felt like it did a really good job of capturing that Thanksgiving vibe with a very close family, but they're all kind of dealing with their own shit and it kind of gives you the bits and pieces. And then it ultimately culminates in I think a really great moment. And I was just really, you know, captivated by it. And uh, I felt like even, you know, over, uh, you know, I, I never thought it overstayed its welcome. Um, I just thought everyone in the movie was fantastic. Uh, I loved the look of it, the sound design, the score, um, everything. I, I just absolutely loved. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm i mostly there with you. I, I like the family dynamics. I really like a lot of the asides, especially when you do see two sides of, of everybody, you know, the good and the bad. Like mm-hmm. I really love the moments where, you know, Beanie Feldstein sort of exposes herself vulnerably and, and lets everybody listen to the music that she's been working yeah. on for so long and talking about how, you know, she's been rejected um, from everywhere where she submitted it. And then, you know, she kind of has this kind of fight with Richard Jenkins and then it leads them into the kitchen where he says, well, if you're not passionate enough, you know, go and work in retail or something like that. Yeah. And it's just like those little moments, I think really strike a chord in terms of being there again, you know, I guess pun intended human and relatable and something that anybody can understand. And there is something interesting and suffocating about setting it during a family holiday where you're stuck with everybody and there's something also in a new apartment with no furniture and nothing really else to do. The dad wants to watch sports, but there's no TV for him to escape to and like all this. Right. And even just the idea of feeling completely isolated and alone from the rest of the world during a holiday, because again, like you look at some of the exterior shots throughout this movie you know, it's almost apocalyptic in a weird way where like there's nobody really around and You'll the people get shot that you do through see... windows that are mirrored and blurred and stuff yeah. like that too. Or yeah. there's like one person sort of walking outside of a, you know, of a, of a shop and you just see them kind of from a distance. You don't really see any of their features. It's just, it, it's, it's very 
very atmospheric in that way. But where I wasn't as big of a fan sometimes is I felt that Lowell Crowley's cinematography and maybe to a point the direction was overcompensating for the fact Fair. that it was a stage, stage to screen yeah. adaptation where you have these carefully composed shots of like dishes and pans in the yeah, sink yeah. or See, I love you know, a stuff. shot yeah. of uh, I, I'm not against it. I just feel like specifically you're aware that it is an adaptation of something that is very static um, yeah. And that's that's going to be sort of, again, you know, we talked a lot about this with Dear Evan Hansen, where, you know, characters and performances emoting sort of in that kind of theatrical way on stage, you can get away with that more where this is like, OK, we're, we're trying to distinguish it. So we're going to have these kind of, you know, strange kind of shots of the back of Richard Jenkins's head. Or we're going to have shots of, you know, again, a lot of the interior, whether it be the wiring or, you know, just it, it, it all feels like it's a little too much, like it's trying too hard and it yeah. doesn't have to. It's so good on just the performances, on just the relatability of how the characters are written. Um, I, I did like a lot of the staging within the film. I think that a lot of sort of the mise-en-scene uh, is well like done in terms of where the, the characters go yeah. on. And it's again, like there are two floors, mm -hmm. so they're going up and down. And I like the idea of like, you know, a neighbor on the upper level, you know, whether they're dancing or knocking around and you, you see the, the light fixture sometimes mm -hmm. moving. Um, there's a lot to like about this movie. And I will take 20 of these oh, over yeah. one Dear Evan Hansen. And well, any day of the week <laughs> and i was surprised by how tonally it is very much a horror adjacent film yeah like it's not that far off from an ari aster movie in, in terms of thinking like a24 releases and there the, is yeah and the shiva baby thing i think is, is I think, a great example and i think i have had a similar you know i, I love using you know a, a genre tropes and stuff to kind of personify anxiety and i think that's such a an, an interesting thing as someone who suffers with that a lot and um yeah I, I i get what you're saying with the cinematography for me i vibed completely with it and i liked that it added that kind of thing even if it went maybe a little bit too hard um so i totally understand what you're saying there but to me it just added to this alien kind of nature to the whole movie where it's, everything felt off or strange even though again it it's about these group of humans and i love the line in the movie where they talk about you know aliens and how they would view humans as the monsters or how a monster would view a human as a monster and they would be the normal ones and that's kind of just the vibe i got from the whole movie as if you were like a fly on the wall like an alien who crash landed and was some weird thing that was in this house and they were just watching these humans and their strange problems to them that felt so weird and alien to them as this monster that's in this house. And I think that's kind of what I loved about it. It is that fly on the wall. Like, and it just, that unsettling nature with the cinematography focusing on the bubbling walls and the stains and, and, and everything and the light fixtures falling out. And like, it just, to me, it felt like in that conversation was intentional with Steven Yun's character kind of talking about with the walking dead, um, like yeah, the zombies. Yeah. yeah. And I just felt like that was so interesting. And then that's kind of what I got from this movie. And, and you could say like, oh, was it all in their heads? Was it all just his anxiety personified? Or is there this kind of presence watching over them in this thing and like kind of you know, everyone's got their own shit going on and it's just this. But that dream that presence. Richard Jenkins yeah. talks about, it's almost like that thing sort of manifests itself in, in some sort of strange way and, and almost haunts, you know, this family as, as the night progresses or at least and just then the maybe idea that, of it. Yeah. And you could take that in different ways. It's like, they're all dealing with really crappy things happening. Like, and you could uh, like, again, they could just be, you know, normal problems people suffer with or is it something else and um yeah that dream he talks about and and they poke fun at him at that but then like you know steven yun's always talking about his dreams oh God, his grass ice cream cone and stuff like that <laughs> he's so mundane and it's just he's phenomenal i love him and everyone in this movie i think it's the best i've ever seen amy schumer um uh june squibb um a legend um uh we haven't talked about her role as the grandmother who's suffering from alzheimer's and um and is there and there's a really sweet moment with that of um 
of, you know, they have to take care of her and it's kind of a, a distraction throughout the night um, because she will get up and wander off or they have to kind of help her. But then they read But also this, how uh, it's affecting, you know, you know, mom and dad financially yeah. as yes, well. And, yeah. and, and, and kind of like, you know, they're doing it out of, you know, love and, and, and family, but there is something there a, that yeah. a bit of a burden, burden yeah. you know, where they and feel that, sort of responsible yeah. no matter what. And, and and that's what I think generationally the movie does so well, too, is just like a, a generational kind of the younger people in a family to your parents, to your grandparents and how everyone's dealing with their own things at that time. And that dream, I think the ending of the movie um, without spoiling it um kind of personifies that dream that he has and i keep using the word personify i'll try to use a different word but like what's a good um, word i, I just that i i'll talk to you about it after eric but i just like loved how that shot was set up and and how it kind of finishes and um you know there's a wonderful moment from you know steven yun who's just he's kind of the outsider and you know he's he's trying to fit in and get the family to like him right so he's just kind of the boyfriend who's trying to t- talk with the dad and bond with him and stuff so when the dad Richard Jenkins talks about makes a list dream. of super food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> he's just I like, I just love the line of like, you should just walk into the tunnel, right? Like that line right. of this dream where, and then he's like, what do you mean? He's like, just walk into the tunnel and see what happens. And he's trying to tell him what to do in this dream. And then it kind of comes full circle in the ending. And I thought it was just, um, just wonderful. And like, um, yeah, man, it just it, it kind of blew me away and became one of my favorite films of the festival. I don't think it overtook Petite Maman, but, um, you know, these familial dramas will always um, always get to me, especially when I can connect with them so deeply where I truly going back to it just felt like it was my family. Like when it was literally five people, you have um, the two males, like the dad and, and the boyfriend in this, which I kind of swap it around a little bit and then you know the two daughters which almost is like nevis and sarah and then the the mom and dad who just reminded me so much of like my mom and dad and um it just and then when you get deeper into the problems that everyone's suffering through i just uh connected with steven yun talking about you know how he's in his mid 30s and that he's going back to school to become a social worker because he suffered from um, some depression in his early 30s and kind of needed to get away from the career he was in and needed to go into something else. And I'm like, it just like there, this movie felt like it was almost made for me. And I think whenever you get a movie that feels like it, you just connect on that level where you're like, it almost feels like someone's like, Matt, this is I'm writing this for you or I'm making this for you. Um, and that's just kind of how I felt. And then when you add in the layers of like, I really did dig the cinematography. I like the unsettling nature of the whole thing. I like putting that horror vibe even onto this thing that has some deeper meanings of like, you know, it's not really, you know, it's scary because everyone suffers, but like it's it, it's just it's really kind of wonderful as well, though, of just kind of this deeply kind of uh quietly devastating um kind of movie just about life and and family and um i just really 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 liked it so (laughs) yeah it's probably one of the best thanksgiving movies um i've ever seen and there's a great sort of you know moment of being thankful and there's a lot of stuff that we haven't talked about whether it be you know sort of uh the the backgrounds of the mom and dad being sort of more versed or or sort of looking to absolve um certain anxieties through religion yeah um and then Which there's is also the one thing i maybe i mean sorry to cut you off eric but no, 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 to no, go good. into that point thank you for bringing that up um yeah, the dad works at a Catholic uh, school and and the mom is is sort of religious as well. And um, I have that from my grandmother, but my dad and, and my mom still, you know. But the grandmother as well, as you learn, is also a reason why, you know, Jenkins and 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 Jane uh, um, uh, Hootie Shell are yeah. are like that. They're, yeah. they, you know, like they're 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 of that generation where you see Beanie Feldstein and, and Amy Schumer kind of you know, they go along with it to a certain degree, but at the same time, like our generation, you know, religion doesn't factor in as much. And I connected and then, with that even. Yeah. Like Nevis yeah, and then, thought it was so creepy when I started saying the blessing that they say before dinner. Right. Like I started saying it along with them and she's like, this is terrifying. Don't ever do yeah. that again. And then oh, that was your own version of the humans there for a minute where it mm-hmm. built some atmosphere and tension. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there's also the stuff which I also kind of found interesting where 
you know, 9-11 is discussed. Oh, and yeah. how there is, you know, a moment of, you know, someone getting lucky and not having been in that building and by chance and sort of having been haunted by that for the red, yes, you know, great. the 20 Thank years after bringing that up as well. Yeah. You know, and I thought and that was always wonderfully talking handled about as well. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought that was again, adding into that anxiety and where that stems from, right. Or that a little bit of being overprotective or just being a, a little bit afraid of everything. And I totally connected with that as well. And it didn't feel like, like, too much or that you're like oh, okay like you're adding that into this like i completely bought into it and i thought it's just not too heavy-handed in the way that it's portrayed throughout the movie it's brought up multiple times but um i thought it was done really really well uh yeah thank yeah you it's it's hard up. it's hard not to mm-hmm. bring something like that up especially when it's almost like you really dodged a bullet and you're kind of just thinking to yourself like you know that that could have been me and to live with that. Like it's going to be something that you think about probably for the rest of your life that I, I really did luck out not ending up, you know, in the tower or in one of the towers. Yeah. And that goes into his anxieties and even that dream he talks about, he, I I think attributes that moment to, you know, he talks about seeing this uh, woman who has skin over her eyes and her mouth is one of the dreams that he's having. And which is also of, funny because then I watched You Are Not My Mother, which also has an image that's representative that's very similar to that, Where, mm-hmm. but it's based in sort of uh, classic Irish folklore and horror. Mm-hmm. But I it's felt just, like the, the stuff in Last Night in Soho kind of looked like that as well. Yeah, no, they do. It, it's interesting that kind of, you know, faceless or, or skin face sort of <laughs> creatures um, or even, I guess, like the Slender Man, I guess, in some ways are are sort of basically sort of infiltrating our our mindset more than than ever and sort of to have a faceless creature be you know the thing that we fear the most because we can't define what it is makes it all the more scarier yeah i totally agree with that um any final thoughts eric before we uh, that you wanted to get out before we give our rating yeah again i i think everybody in this is is really good you mentioned that amy schumer um you know very subtle performance uh and 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 again someone that's at a crossroads uh with her life on multiple levels and you think like you know this this is a film that could easily be very very showy and give the actors kind of big moments and everybody's great and everybody has sort of great scenes but it never feels like okay we're giving you an oscar clip you know like it's it, it feels more lit which is why this will rustic. go pretty much unnoticed but yeah it's 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 very subtle and 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 sublime in in, in many ways and um you know there's there's one shot as well that i keep thinking a lot of um that involves a tray of dessert and you know jane uh Houdichel, um staring at it and how devastating and sad it is in that moment i thought was uh really uh very powerful and again you know you could have played that bigger or drawn more attention to it but it's just it's done in a manner that is both respectful to the character and to people sort of battling you know stress and anxiety through eating and then Mm -hmm. also um it's just i think it says so much about the character and where she is in the moment and you know she's probably the maybe the least well known of of the cast she she's a theaterizing actor. her role from the original show yeah yeah and the last thing that she was in which was um <laughs> she had a small role as as uh the maid in um little women and uh oh, so right. yeah it's 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 a really good um ensemble that you know it's you can tell that everybody is working together and you know being uh, completely selfless in sort of the performances and, and sort of bouncing off that and also just having material to work with that, you know, allows them to deliver, you know, lines and and feelings in a way that isn't just one way. It's, mm-hmm. you know, they can play it off in different manners and there's more subtext to it all. And I think that that's a very um, rich experience. Um, yeah, I just uh, some of the technical stuff just kind of felt like it was trying too hard and it didn't need to. It just it it had so much going for it that when it got in its way, it was more noticeable. And I understand Fair. why it's doing that. But mm-hmm. I also felt like, OK, like you don't you don't need to try that hard. Right. Where I like 
that to give it another element different than what you would get on stage. But I totally understand where you're coming from. Uh, I love it. Uh, it's one of my favorite movies of the year. Uh, I think it's the second best thing I've seen at the festival. Um, personally, uh, it still did not overtake Petite Maman, which I just think is that both movies uh, are almost perfect to me. But I'm going to give it a four and a half. I really loved it. I'm going to give it a three and a half out of five. And like George Costanza, I'm going to donate to the human fund. <laughs> Sweet. Uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, we're covering the entirety of the Toronto International Film Festival this year. So you can go back and check out all of our reviews over on podcast services at Untitled Movie Reviews or right here on YouTube on the Untitled uh, movie reviews podcast uh, YouTube channel. Um, we're gonna. I think we just hit a hundred subscribers in our first, you know, couple weeks, really, which is totally uh, all the Dune lovers dope. out there. Oh, whew. <laughs> that's rough. <laughs> um, so we'll, we should have like an easy URL soon uh, for for you guys. Um, because right now it's a complicated one. We just have to link you there. Um, you can check out all of our other stuff. Our our, our best spot to get everything. Eric's dogs are losing it um someone's you, doing the uh, uh the lawn someone's cutting oh uh, no it's all why. good dude don't worry about it you know we're, we're cash here boris and george um, what jerks um go to our letterbox hq which is untitled underscore movies it's kind of a one-stop shop for everything so instead of pointing you to a hundred different places you can just go over there you'll find all of our links to our reviews and 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 you know personal channels and ratings and all that kind of stuff so um as always my name is matt rohrbeck you can find more of my work around the internet but mostly on untitledmoviepodcast.com and you can follow me on all those social medias at matt rohrbeck and i'm eric Marchin. you can find more of my video reviews at rogerstv.com slash cinema scene and on the social medias at em6211 until next time i was also kind of disappointed that they didn't have a song from the human league on the yeah. soundtrack or more human than human is that a song no that's well, you're thinking of uh, uh, White Zombie, where they they, right. they mentioned that, but also you're thinking of Blade Runner, um, mm -hmm. yeah, the mm -hmm. the slogan that the Tyrell Corporation. Oh has. yeah, okay, cool. All right, bye everybody. Great movie. <laughs> Stay human.